Hi, John, and welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. No, thanks for the invitation, man. It's uh, it's nice to see you again. Yeah, yeah, you too as well. And uh, hopefully, as the world begins to open up again, I'll I'll get to go on a few of your courses. I'm I'm looking forward to that. You know, it's been yeah, stuck yeah. here in the weekends. It's kind of like, ugh, like it'd be nice to actually get out in this lovely southern weather and actually learn something. You know, yeah, especially no, get out in the fair. woods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't wait. They're looking pretty good at the moment. Which is good. Oh. 100%. So we have you on today uh, to essentially discuss your life story and to share, you know, your words of wisdom and the life lessons you've learned uh, or some of the life lessons you've learned in your total experience as an adult so far. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I'll stop talking. I'll let you take it away. What is your story, John? Well, I was, um, I was sort of born in in lincoln into a military family into a, a a royal air force family my dad was in the royal air force police um fairly sort of un un uh, uneventful childhood until about the age of seven um where my my mum and my dad split up they uh, they got divorced um i didn't really know much about it at the time to be perfectly honest with you it was just you know I woke up one morning, mum wasn't there. Mm. Um, dad said she's gone for a message <laughs> and then just basically didn't come back. It's a very it's a hell of a long message. I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Where the hell has she been? <laughs> and then um and then yeah, you know, I, I don't quite you know, we got, got used to the idea and we started, you know, started seeing things and stuff like that, uh, seeing each other. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you know, moving from place to place every three years, uh, new to RF Newton to uh, Germany, and that was pretty horrific. Like moving from from England to Germany and getting split up from not not being able to see your mum at weekends and that sort of stuff. But my dad met someone else, and you know, got my stepmom; she was amazing, and all that sort of all all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, I spent most of my childhood. Um, either in military bases or RAF bases in England or RAF bases in Germany. Um, and then, um, yeah, what was his childhood? Like, it, didn't, it wasn't a smooth ride. Like, I, don't, I didn't have a smooth ride. I was fairly, like, not extremely bullied, but I was bullied. I mean, it's constantly being the new kid in school, um, nowhere near as sort of confident and as brazen as I like to portray myself now. And, um, and and then the home life was pretty. It was good. It was nice. But my sort of old man ruled with a bit of an iron fist. So there was a, mm. you know, wasn't wasn't afraid of giving out sort of good hidings as they were called. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's, I wouldn't say I was. I'm certainly not mentally scarred by and all that. I start breaking down and crying. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then um, yeah, then I I we I sort of I sort of left. I finished school in Scotland um, uh, and moved, left home at 16. Um, moved down to Nottingham because we were living in, yeah, we were living in Scotland at the time. And we moved, I moved down to Nottingham um, to go and live with my mum uh, and try and get, try and get a job essentially because there was nothing going on in, uh, at Kinloss where we were based. Um, and then I did a uh, sort of a two-year mechanics apprenticeship i did two out of three years of mechanic apprenticeship jacked it in because i didn't like it (laughs) Uh, for smelling like minging engine oil and um the guy i was working for was a bit of a uh, uh, in hindsight he was sound but as a 16 year old 17 year old uh, you know he was annoying he was (laughs) better than this i'd love to bump into him again and go actually i'm sorry for being dick (laughs) uh, yeah we're we're all we're all dicks at 16 i think it's just part of the process isn't it it. yeah yeah. you you know everything you don't need adults (laughs) um yeah and then um and then at 18 i decided to join the air force but there was a there's a period between that sort of 16 and 18 before i joined the military where um then I I was massively going down the wrong way, down like a huge way. I I I'd left home, left my dad, my stepmom in Scotland, who you know was extremely strict, or my dad, so he was extremely strict. Um, and I suddenly moved down to Nottingham, where my mum wasn't strict. Um, 
and suddenly found all this freedom. Like, whoa, I could do anything I want and no one's going to hit me if I get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, right, amazing. Um, so I was suddenly, yeah, like, given all this freedom and I uh, I started smoking just cigarettes. You know, I just started smoking cigarettes and then I, I got in with a, a group of friends who were all, you know, all really nice people, uh, all really nice. They were just, you know, good, good, solid people. But we were, I suppose we classed as sort of stoners. We were like, the, you know, <laughs> like an uncool Scooby-Doo gang. <laughs> without, yeah, without them. Scoob- the Scooby snacks meant uh, yeah, far more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so yeah, I got into sort of heavy cannabis use. Um, and just sort of not really going anywhere, not really doing anything, just getting stoned every day and listening to music. And um, and then uh, it was an event one evening where we took my cousin's boat and he we had a little like river boat and we took it onto the River Trent, which is right outside where my mum lives. Um, and we would drive, <laughs> drive this driver boat. Do you drive a boat? You're, <laughs> I, make, I make the engine go round and round to steer yeah. somebody else's problem <laughs> That's it, yeah. I got, we got on this boat anyway and we we're just going out there was four of us going out um we're going to sleep on it and just camp in 17 year old lads you know just not caring a world sort of thing yeah and we moored up um at this lock and um i remember it it was like clear as yesterday my cousin brought out a a BB gun, like one of those little plastic pistols. Oh, yeah, yeah. Plastic pellets. And then um, we put up, it was like proper um, Hicksville. We were smoking weed and we put up these beer cans on a sign and we were just plinking them off. Yeah. And then um, and there were some fishermen over the other side of the river that were giving us grief because we were making too much noise and scaring the fish away. I'm like, <laughs> I don't even think fish have ears. So here I, I don't <laughs> quite know how that works. But anyway, we were scaring the fish. And um and they and they uh they called the police and said that that we were shooting at them uh, oh, wow. and they were I know yeah it was pretty pretty um unbeknownst to me at the time they were like yeah they were, bullets are whizzing past our heads and they're shooting at us oh. uh, so I, we, we went by this point we'd gone gone into the boat gone into bed you know we were just lying there and I was lying there wasted just completely. <laughs> <laughs> baked like oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and, um, and uh i remember looking up at the the sky through the the window of the little boat we were on and to see this massive floodlight on the river and could hear like road blades going but because i was i was out of there i mean i was so <laughs> so stoned um i was like i gotta go and see what that is and I told my mates, I was like, I told my cousin or two mates, like, mate, there's some weird light out there. And they were just as stoned as I was. I'm like, yeah, man, it's, <laughs> it's questioning our, our existence. I'm like, no, there's actually a real light out there. <laughs> and then I got off the boat and I, I took two steps off the boat onto the, the whatever it is, the side of the river. And uh, there was a police officer there with, uh, rifle with a like a oh wow a, yeah like I, uh, I didn't know at the time but I'm assuming it's some sort of like MP5 or something like that it was, just, you know, it was a, a machine gun at that age you know? <laughs> and uh, he turned around and went all right sunshine oh, there any- <laughs> I was like, this, is, this is getting weirder and weirder are there any guns on this boat and I knew that there was obviously a a plastic BB gun so yeah. I turned around and went yeah mate I'll go and get them for you if you want. <laughs> and and with that, I turned around to walk back onto the boat and be the helpful young man that, you know, that I generally was. And with that, I just sort of like put face down on the ground and went, no, mate, we'll go and get them for you. And, uh, <laughs> and that's where things started spinning out of control because there was police dogs and people with guns and uh, yeah. all for like four knobheads that were just sort of shooting BBs. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, sort of, we got arrested, obviously um taken to taken to the local police station and char- not charged um we were released or put in a cell I was put in a cell um and at that point I was like man I need to sort my life out in fact it was it was until the day after where I decided to sort my life out yeah but I actually remember falling to sleep in the police cell 
and this is one of my most sort of bizarre memories from childhood, is I woke up in the cell and the cell door was wide open. And I remember thinking to myself, I could probably walk out of there and just walk off. But I'm in that much trouble now. Probably best just stay where you are. And then with that, with that thought, the policeman popped his head around and went, well, are you coming then or what? <laughs> so <laughs> I walked out and there was my mum with my auntie. And I'm shuffling along in shoes and no flipping laces. <laughs> and, um, and they basically released us on bail. And it's a report back a month later. And I must, yeah, if anyone wants to have a diet, like definitely get arrested and be released on bail for a month because I was just <laughs> yeah I was so ill I didn't eat like really nervous worried all the time didn't eat yeah. you know as you would be thinking your life is about to go down the flipping swanee yeah before it's even started <laughs> and uh and then and in the end they were just like look don't even bother coming in we've done the ballistics on the BB gun <laughs> the, the fishermen have said like actually what they reported was complete rubbish and um and all they had on us were, you know, a little bit of cannabis use. Um, so they were like, look, we're not going to do anything with you, arrest you or, or anything like that. You're just free to go. Don't be a sort of dick. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, nice. Um, I won't. And then he said to me, what do you want to do when you sort of, what are you going to do with yourself? What do you want to do? And I turned around and went, I, I think I'm going to, I want to be a police officer, actually. I think I'm going to, I'm going to join the Royal Air Force as a police officer. And he was just chuckling away. He was like, oh, <laughs> you need to crap, like stop that behavior straight away. I was like, yeah, I know, I know. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort my life out. I'm gonna yeah. I'm, I'm gonna do it. And um and then walked out of there, like in a daze, thinking, Jesus, John, you've been so lucky. Like yeah. take take that as a as a sort of warning. Um and uh yeah, and then uh, sort of two weeks later, um I was in the AFCO going gonna have a job <laughs> like joined up so uh, yeah joined up started filling out the paperwork literally two weeks later um and that was the that was the path to the to sort of sorting my life out yeah um and then uh yeah then what happened after that wow um went through military training uh i'm just gonna grab it yeah no worries went through royal air force training no problems whatsoever sort of breezed it thought it was yeah. going to be so much harder than it was but you get there and you're like well this is it yeah it's only a four-star hotel is it yeah it's, it's, <laughs> it's, oh right oh, this is it yeah um yeah no it was fine um passed out of police training no no problems got posted yeah. to RAF Brampton which is in uh Bedfordshire Cam oh, Cambridge actually Cambridgeshire um, anyway, near Huntingdon, and um, spent three years there quite sort of happily, living the life of a blue suit, you know. Um, got involved in a few pretty sort of um, full-on investigations. I was um, one of my major first major jobs was uh, doing the uh, missing persons, and then a body sort of body deposition search of um the two girls that were killed by ian huntley and max in car um oh really yeah wow. yeah so um jessica chapman and holly wells I'll never forget those two names i'll never forget them um wow. they obviously they were killed by yeah. ian huntley and um and uh um assisted or covered up by max in car yeah um and um yeah, I remember like doing the missing person search, hoping obviously everyone was hoping that they were going to find them. Um, yeah. When the when the um, missing person search had sort of fizzled out, um, and they were there, unfortunately their sort of bodies were found. Um, we assisted Cambridge, the unit I was with, assisted Cambridge of police with the sort of um, post post um, Soco. So you know the guys at csi essentially yeah after yeah. those boys had gone in and done all the sort of like tiny tiny minute stuff <clears throat> we went into the area and fingertip searched it um and that was that was pretty horrific like it's um the the site was pretty grim uh as of what had sort of 
and what have happened, what has happened, what had happened to them, them. Those girls, obviously, their bodies were dumped outside. I think it was Lake and Heath Air Base, the US Air Base. Um, and then after that, like literally three days after, I was on the plane to the Falklands. Going, oh, right. Who did, who, going, did you, like, who did you annoy to get to posted to the Falklands? God knows, mate. No <laughs> idea. No idea. Um, it was like my first attachment. So yeah. four, first four months attachment. And actually, I really enjoyed it. They say if you come back, you come back either as sort of one of three things when you go to the Falklands, either a workaholic, an alcoholic or a gymaholic. Um, <laughs> I went straight down the alcohol route. Like, <laughs> hey, uh, hey, hey. Getting um, with the penguins. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Yeah, going penguin tipping and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so I went went to the Falklands in 2002, September yeah. 2002, because it was a year after, obviously, the Twin Towers. Um, oh, yeah, was it that long ago? Wow. Yeah, I know. It's, time flies, doesn't it? It's, yeah. uh, that wasn't the pun. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, I only just caught on. That was like, <laughs> no, that was not fun. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, it's. Um, it, I went to Falklands. It, that was uh, an eye-opening experience. It was sort of like a bit of a coming of age as a like the first time tri service and um, having to deal with the army, uh, which is never easy. Um, and then, sort of from there. Came back to the U. Came back to the UK. You know, no, no issues in the Falklands. It was a good laugh. I enjoyed it. Um, came back to the UK and um, carried on, sort of plodding on. Got serious with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're sort of building that relationship in the background. You know. Just, between detachments, so she went to Iraq in 2003, and then I went to Iraq in 2003, uh, end of 2003. And then I got, I was on, uh, posted onto a unit uh, called ta- the Tactical Provost Wing or TPW, um, which is sort of like the Royal Air Force Police's um, quick ready deployment tr- troops or whatever you want to call them. Um, and that was great, man. I did five years on there. Um, I did two tours of, uh, three tours of Iraq. Um, one and a bit like of Afghan, a full tour of Afghan, and then like flitting in and out of country here, there, and everywhere. I, I went to Oman, um, doing some sort of uh, undercover work. <laughs> sounds sounds glamorous, but it really wasn't. There was a there was a a big ship that had come into Muscat in Seed, um, and basically we. My job was to go around in civvies to all the five star, six star hotels and basically kick sailors out of the bar when they got too drunk. That was essentially it. Um, mm. And listen to, listen to normally officers actually chatting brazenly about like where the boat was and what yeah. assets they had on board and you know, that loose, li- loose lips sink ship sort of thing. Um, and I'd just be pretend to be a tourist going yeah i'm working i'm on, a, on the oil rigs uh, yeah. um and then they'll tell you what you got and then they go actually i'm a service police officer you're under arrest <laughs> so, <Wow>. uh, <laughs> so, um, that was a good job that was a good job um so we got some yeah got some good results from that um and then and then yeah and then i, I did various things in iraq so um force protection and police work scenes of crime investigations and um <clears throat> as well as all the sort of bombs and bullet and counteracting sort of uh, ambushes and all that sort of jazz yeah. that you would expect to, at that time of afghan and iraq yeah um and then slowly um i started to suffer with the amount of tours i was doing i started to take a heavy toll um my my best mate used to nickname me Jonah. I don't know where it, the, the name comes from, particularly, but apparently there's a guy in the a story in the Bible. Oh, yeah, Jonah. Everything happens to Jonah, basically, to the point where he's pretty much cursed. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. 
Yeah, something along. I know, those certain, I know, certainly on a on a ship, you know, if you get nicknamed the Jonah, it's definitely not a good omen. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah. Every every uh, every ship you're on, it sinks. You're definitely a Jonah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Then yeah, yeah, there you yeah. go. And uh, he was like, "Oh, you're a Jonah, you are." And uh, and it, it's like almost a self fulfilling prophecy because every time I was out on the ground, something would happen, or yeah, I would left Dean or something, um, or someone would blow up, you know, or someone would somebody would. It was just, it was just horrible, man. It was just horrible, and it got to the point where I was just mentally breaking down. Yeah. Um. And I, I got back to the UK <clears throat> off my last tour in two thousand and beginning of two thousand and seven, and went to the went to the doctors and said, "Look, something's not right. I'm I'm struggling, man." Um. And he was like, "Right, yeah, let's let's do some some analysis on you and ask me a load of questions about." Or whatever they ask you, I can't even remember. And um, and uh, and then turned around and went, oh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Um, go, uh, you're probably just stressed out. Go and have, uh, go out one evening this week. Get wrecked. Get in a fight. Take your take your take your sort of take your but aggressions out on somebody. A, a doctor said this. Yeah, a psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, right. That's. That's uh, fucking strange. I know, I know. Was he was he on the Skibby Snacks? Was he? I don't know, mate. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, Air Commodore he was as well. So it's like pretty. I don't know what that is an equivalent into the Navy, but Air Commodore is pretty high. That's it? yeah, it's very high. But yeah, um, the amount of brains like, associated with that rank is still, de- you know, dependable. Yeah, yeah. Dependable. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so yeah, it was like oh, there's nothing wrong with me. So I went back to work. Like I didn't go and get drunk and I didn't get in a fight, but I, I went back to work and. Um, got told that I was being promoted and, and everything was sort of going well. And I just, but then they turned around to me uh, um, and said, you're being deployed again. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't face it. I just could not face going back out to theatre. Yeah. Um, so I, so I handed my sort of papers in, PVR, yeah. um, which is like asked to be released essentially. I, I quit handing my notice. Um, um and um and then started a year later started my um sort of trying to find my feet in city street um which was tricky to say the least man you know i yeah. i went from i did three years in city street before i really enlisted in the army and i did maybe 12 jobs um so i did i started off as a security um guard officer whatever you want to call it it's a, it's a security guard as far as i'm concerned um working at a uh, a factory doing loss prevention so they were losing a lot of kit and stuff people were nicking stuff so we were just securities trying to stop them doing that um and then i uh, then i got promoted in that i got made the manager of the crew um, but I was still feeling, I was still having nightmares and still feeling sort of really angry and agitated about everything, really. I had such a bad temper. Um, and I, I left that job um, t- to go to uh, another job when they, they were building a new road for the Weymouth Relief Road um, mm. for the Olympics, for all the sailing. And um, there was a, a load of military, ex-military guys that were essentially dragging protesters out of the trees um, at at the beginning. Um, And then we're just walking up and down this building site, this massive, like, however long the road was, I don't remember, but walking along this building site of a a road, basically trying to check that hippies and protesters and stuff like that weren't climbing over diggers and nicking stuff and trying to, you know... um, and um yeah and that kind of that kind of just job fizzled out and it was at that point where i decided i wanted to sort of change career and got into working with boats and i worked in a marina on a dry stack so driving these huge forklift trucks um that pick boats up basically drop them in the water um, and pick them up it was great and i enjoyed that it was like outside by the beach or by the sea but i was still having these sort of nightmares and still having flashbacks and things were getting progressively progressively worse 
Um, and there was a couple of other jobs like security manager at Sunseeker Boats and various bits and bobs like that. And uh, it was at that point where I'd, <clears throat> I'd reached sort of near enough rock bottom. And I thought, oh, the only way to deal with this is to re enlist, is to go back into the yeah, sort what of world, doing. what I knew. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to go through the sort of rigmarole of rejoining the Air Force. Um, because the only trade I'd want to do would be RAF police and to come back to see all those people again, having that they moved on for years. And then I, and it, I just like, no, I'm not doing that. It's not, yeah. that's not happening. Yeah. Um, so I joined the army, um, and did, I did four, four years in the army. Um, first, first year actually was pretty good. You know, I, things settled down in my head a little bit. It was nice. It was nice to be back in sort of in the big, green machine type thing and i was aware of it, it it was just nice it was just like being back home um and then i got promoted again which was great you know my career was i was looking like i was going gonna have a good career and then um and then one day i was on guard duty and i was stood with someone with my rifle um on the front front gate at Blanford camp and I just I can remember so clear I remember looking around and like Blanford is in Dorset it's pretty green you know it's, it's not it's as far removed from Iraq as you could possibly <laughs> get but I was looking around man, and everything I could just I was just in Iraq it was so surreal it was like I was looking at the grass but the grass wasn't grass it was sand it was just it was so weird um the smell was the same, the sense of like heat. It was just incredible. It, well, it wasn't incredible, it was bloody scary, but like how, how bizarre it happened. And I just sort of zoned out by the looks of it, by, by what people would tell me. It, one of my mates came over and was like, tapped me on the shoulder. It's like, mate, you, just come on, start sparking, like, snap out of it, what, what daydreaming. And I, and I turned around to him and I was like, Mate, the weirdest things that happened to me. I told him, and he was like, "All oh, right, okay, you know, that's odd." That evening, I went home and told my wife that, that this like daytime flashback had happened. And over a space of about two weeks, it was just getting worse and worse. Man, they were happening like every day, and I was getting like properly stressed out about going into work, and I wasn't sleeping. And I went to see. I was like, "I've got to go and see the doctor." Now. So I went to see the SMO um, or the station doctor and he turned around after I basically told him everything, the, the whole, you know, absolutely everything. Um, he turned around and went, all right, um, we'll send you to uh, the Department of Mental Health at Tidworth. He said, but I'll just let you know before you leave this room, if you flag this up, higher up this chain he said your your career will be over he said but if you want to walk out the door and pretend this conversation never happened you can walk out the door and um that's shocking. And I, yeah yeah well, it kind of, i can kind of like looking back and see his point you know but i think in his own in his own way he was trying to do do a do a favor or do the right thing by Someone who essentially knew, he knew, you know, your career is done once you start saying that you're having flashbacks and nightmares, and you know they're not going to let you anywhere near a live weapon again. And if you can't be a soldier in the army, then you're pretty much surplus to requirements, aren't you? Mm. Um, and I was like, no man, I want to talk to someone. I got to talk to someone because this is not this is not right. Um, and I never went back to work. I went to I went back to I went to the the Department of Mental Health the very next day. Um, told a nurse, this big, big black guy, like from sort of Jamaica or something. He's, I can't remember his name now, but he was massive. Um, and he had, he had a proper sense of humour on him. And uh, I remember telling him everything was in, the, in there for a couple of hours. And he was like, look, man, I'm, I'm a nurse. I can't diagnose you. Um, but I can tell you what you've got. And I'm like, what is it? And he's like, you've got PTSD. And I was like, right. Um, Okay, well, 
He said, but I can't diagnose it. You need to see a, a psychiatrist um, to get that diagnosis. He said, but I'll tell you now, I've seen so many people come through here and I'd put my mortgage on it that you've got PTSD. And I was like, all right, fair enough. Um, he said, so we'll put you an appointment with a psychiatrist and we'll get things sorted. But until then, you need to um, basically go home and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get things sorted. And I said, well, I'm actually... I'm due on night. I'm supposed to be on nights tonight. So I'll, um, I'll go, I'll go from here. I'll go to work and, um, I'll do my night shift and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll report to the sort of my staff sergeant in the morning. And he was like, no, you don't understand. You're not going back to work. And like, and I could go, I was like, what? No, I'm on nights tonight. So yeah. I, I've got to go to the night shift, otherwise someone will get addicted in my place to be on my night shift. And he's like, no, 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 not tonight, not tomorrow, not ever. He's like, I can't tell you, I'm not telling you this, but you're going to get med discharge. I was like, what? He's like, yeah. And then it's sort of like, I was kind of like, all oh, right. Yeah. That was, that was, this is a bit surreal. But I just, I sort of took it for what it was and thought to myself, well, you can't diagnose me, so we'll go and see the psychiatrist and see what he says. Um, and then I went to see the psychiatrist. And it, it, it it's an, annoys me to this day because I can't remember his name, but he was a civvy, um, and he was from Cyprus. Um, and my, he was such a character. He was so cool. <laughs> such a quality, like, I can't remember his name. I missed the, it might come to me. Um but I went upstairs into his office for my first sort of meeting and uh, he's like, I right, sit down and chatting away. And he was sort of typing away and going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, typing away. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him everything. He was asking me all these questions. Like, does this happen? Does that happen? Does this happen? Does this, you know? And I was just like, yeah, this all the time, that, that, yeah, blah, blah. filled out some paperwork. He looked at it and he carried on typing. And I must've been in there for a couple of hours. And he, I remember he's like pressed enter and then sort of spun his chair around to face me. And he was like, right, do you want to know what's wrong with you then? I was like, well, yeah. You know, <laughs> That'd be yeah. ideal. Oh, that would be mega, wouldn't it? And uh, he said, you've got fist syndrome. And I was like, what? He's like, fist syndrome. Have you ever heard of it? And I was like, no, never. And he went, yeah, it stands for the fucked up in the head. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all right, uh, mega. And he went, yeah, you probably know it's PTSD. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, fucked in the head. Syndrome. Definitely a character, this guy, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he was, man, he was. And he said to me, basically, we'll have some, some. we had some sort of sessions. He didn't, we never did any sort of therapy sessions with him because obviously time's too busy. But I went out to see a, a, a therapy nurse and, um, did so uh, EMDR um, eye movement desensitization. Yeah, I, I vaguely heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, it's where basically they they get you to sort of try and connect the left and the right side of your brain by wiggling a finger in your like that and fo your eyes following it. It's basically <clears throat> it didn't witchcraft. work. Yeah, witchcraft. Yeah, it didn't work. And then we did, and um, we also did some CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapies, talking yeah. therapies, and stuff like that. Yeah, and um, it made it just made everything worse. Oh really? Um, yeah, it didn't, CBT didn't help it worse. Yeah, yeah. So because I was, I the PTSD was so severe that, and I was so traumatized by sort of like eight or nine incidents on top of each other that breaking one incident down was a nightmare because it was all interlinked. Oh, of course, right? Okay. Um, so. Uh, and then I developed, whenever I would talk about it, I would develop a speech impediment. So I'd develop a really, really bad stutter. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. uh, and I couldn't speak, literally couldn't speak. I, they would ask me questions about incidences and I would not be able to get my words out. It'd be like... Duh, 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 yeah. duh. It sounds um, a lot like the shell shock stories you would hear in World War One. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I wasn't in World War One because I'd have just been shot, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, down. that's very true. Thank you for the time moved on. Yeah, yeah, thankfully, yeah. Um and it was yeah, and it was it was that and my I would develop these ridiculous twitches. My sort of uh leg would just be like brrr, rapid fire on the sort of bouncing yeah. up and down. I just couldn't control anything. Um and it was at that, you know, after about 
eight months of therapy that they they turn around and be like, no, nah, can't help you, can't help you, mate. You are you. There's nothing we can do. Basically, there's not. We've we've exhausted all our resources and everything that is um that sort of approved for treatment of of PTSD. We've tried and you're too far gone. You're like, well, there's nothing we can do about it. We, 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 there's nothing we can do. Talking about it doesn't work. EMDR is making it worse. Like the only thing that we can possibly do is remove you from this environment in its entirety. Um, so I sort of went home and so, were pretty relieved actually that, that, that it was all over in regards to the therapy at least. Right. And um, I got, uh, I had a med board and got med discharge, told I was going to get med discharge, got given six months notice. Um, got help from Help for Heroes, like through, went through their sort of um, uh, program of, with the military and Help for Heroes at the time. Well, I don't know if they are now again, but they got, got together and sort of did their, programs the core recovery events to help you get back into city street and help you all that sort of jazz yeah and um um and at this point i was like rock bottom i was yeah i was suicidal i mean i i've gone home a, a few times and sort of contemplated the suicide and planned how i was going to do it and like i knew i, I genuinely felt like i was a hindrance like people would be better off without me genuinely from the like not even the remotest bit sort of wondering wondering whether it would be the right thing to do right heartfelt genuine like if i just top myself this goes away for everybody it doesn't just go away for me because obviously i'll be dead and end off this goes away for my wife it goes away from Zach won't have to deal with it. My son, you know, people can get on with their lives. Um, and it, this was this wasn't sort of helped by the fact that family members were actively questioning whether I was on the black, whether I was. I remember my mum saying, "Are you just making? You're just making it up to get a pension." And I said to my, I said to her, I flipped, like I've proper fucking lost it. And I was like, she says, you're just, you're just making up. And I said, I must be a, <laughs> using language, really bad language. Right? No, no, a that's a fucking good actor. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> because not only have I managed to convince a, a fucking GP, a psychiatric nurse, a psychologist, a, a psychiatrist who's at the top of his game, the military, I said, if I was that fucking good of an actor, I'd be on the red carpet, wouldn't I? I'd be yeah. at Hollywood. Here's your Oscar. I'd be a movie star. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. yeah here's an Oscar. Yeah. yeah. Um, Unbelievable she, thing to say to yeah, someone struggling, like. Yeah, yeah. And she just thought I was making up, and she didn't want to. She didn't want to talk about. It. She wouldn't even comprehend it. She was literally like, "Nah, there's, there's nothing wrong with him. He's making it up," mm. which is utterly bollocks because I would. You know, it was I was. I was mate, I, it's so so bad do you, at the time. Do you feel that a lot of people aren't taken seriously when they do chat about PTSD and other mental health issues? It's kind of like this is really inconvenient. This is heavy stuff. I really don't want to talk about it because it makes me feel uncomfortable. I, I, uh, from, it, from the from from the other person's perspective, um, possibly back sort of. Um, because when I was sort of going through my, I was at my worst sort of 2004, 13, 2013, 2014. So I thought I probably think things have come a long way in such a short period of time. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I remember an incident where my mum had come down and she was like, um, we went out to pick a Christmas tree and I was like, I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. But I was, she was like forced to go and fucking do it. And I just couldn't make a decision, just lost my rag completely blew my fucking blew my top like rushed home and she was like oh i don't know what's wrong with him like it, it, we're only picking a christmas tree in case like look this is what it's like this guy can't even get dressed in the morning let alone i leave him in the morning in his sort of dressing gown with a cup of tea 
and I come back six hours later and he's still there with the same cup of tea that's obviously gone cold, still in the dressing room, still staring off into space. It's like it, the guy's he's, he's fracked. He's, he's absolutely fucked. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it probably like back, uncomfortable back then. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess people take it differently, don't they? People either accept it or question it, but yeah, it is what yeah. it is, I suppose. Um, and then yeah, and then I had lots of sort of help from my wife, and slowly but surely got back on my feet and got involved with a charity that helped me out massively. Like I can't underestimate how much they sort of helped me out supporting wounded veterans. Um, if there's any veterans listening to this that need help, man, they're the guys to go and see. Um, and um, yeah, um, I got involved with this skiing program, and then they helped me hook me up with um, a beautiful family called the Van Geese family who let me use their woodland and that's sort of the point where I was like right sort your fucking life out as best you can I was on pills um like the old antidepressants and stuff um and I was slowly learning how to manage slowly but surely we're learning how to manage a PTSD um and the more I got into bushcraft um and more I spent time in nature and exercising and stuff like that the better I say the better I got the more I could manage it um up until the point where you know I've been running Wildway now for nearly eight years and I'm now um have PTSD you know well under control you know on a scale of one to ten I'd say I'm an actively got a got a seven seven and a half grip on it um, which is more than I could have ever sort of hoped for back in the day. I'm still on the tablets, which is the next major hurdle um, to come off those. Um, but yeah, now I'm able to I'm able to help people, um, other veterans, uh, public speaking, and you know, charity work. And I'm actually going back to next year skiing with um, supporting wounded veterans again, but this time as a civvy. So essentially as a, as a buddy, ski buddy. Mm. Um, so to help the veterans and stuff. So yeah, man, it's, it's, come, it's come a long way, but um, that sort of brings us up to sort of present day, really. Um, yeah. Things have, yeah, things have, um, things have been okay. I mean, throwing about of uh, about a thyroid cancer two years ago and having your neck sliced open. That was a uh, kind I of remember, fucking, you kind of forget I, about that. I remember see, seeing that as well on uh, the old Facebook. I was like, For what, what is going on? But yeah, I, man, I was, I was overjoyed hearing that, uh, you know, that, you know, you were cancer free at that stage and, you know, um, yeah, 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 that was, um, that was a little, that was like a nice shot across the bowels. Um, having been diagnosed with thyroid cancer a couple of years ago, just before Christmas, that was, um, yeah, but again, you know, it's just another, another challenge to face in it. You just sort of yeah. get on and crack on. And I mean, I was very lucky in the fact that I found a lump early and then the doctors were superb and I had lots of great care. So, you know, I'm yeah. fortunate in that respect. Yeah. That, that is just an incredible story. And there's, I've, like I've literally got a page worth of <laughs> notes here. No Unfortunately, worries. we don't have the time to get to dive deep into every aspect of it, even though I would love to. But there, there was a few things you mentioned there, and I do want to tackle, especially the PTSD part of it. <clears throat> but especially considering that, I, while I welcome audience of all types and colors and whatever, if you find value in this podcast, that's fantastic. But the, the point of the podcast is to help prepare people who are just leaving school or university even for for life. But if if people who are still in school, uh, the first thing I want to touch out about is uh, you said that you were bullied, which I was very surprised at, to be honest, yeah. um, because, you know, I've only ever known you as you know, wild way, John, yeah, 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 yeah. very, very confident, very outgoing guy in the woods. Um, you know, I, I was bullied as well at school, definitely not pleasant, but you know, what, what would you say to people who were in your position who, who are being are, bullied, who are being bullied? Yeah. Um, I would say hand on heart, when you've got a group of people that are bullying you, 
the first one that opens his mouth is the first one you hit. <laughs> and it will all go away um, now obviously I, I I look at you know I can look at my 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 14 you know year old self and I, I just didn't have a confidence in it because obviously you, you fear that you're going to get beat up or you fear yeah. that it's going to get worse for you <clears throat> 100% um, so I would say um Talk, to talk, to let people know. Like, let you, let your teachers know. Like, let parents know. Um, and yeah, and, and and grow the try and generate the courage to all the, the bullies are just just cowards, man. They just need you. Just need to put them in their place and make. Essentially, your job is, is basically to make their lives make you make them bullying you more fat than it's worth. So they yeah. go on. To, unfortunately, so they go on to somewhere else. Yeah. And, uh, sticking one on one of them <laughs> it's the easiest way of doing it because they don't like anyone but it, you know a bully does not like someone that would stand up to him uh, no so, i, I uh, one thing i would like to say is that don't be ashamed i think there's a lot of shame associated with bullying it's kind yeah. of like if you, uh, there's there's shame in the fact that you're perceived as weak or you know not normal or something and yeah. you know admit ad, a bit like adults admitting they've got mental health problems a kid admitting that they're getting bullied there's almost like this deep it, i don't know where yeah. it comes from this deep intrinsic shame and it's kind of like don't yeah it's like it's not warranted there's no evidence to say you should be ashamed of that Absolutely. but you know um do tell you know anyone and everyone that you are being bullied and the appropriate authorities can deal with it I mean, I, I'm, I, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, but what I was going to say, and this is one thing I, like, if I could go back in time, I would swap all the Xboxes, I would swap all the best toys I ever got for Christmas, I would sell them all and pay for self-defense classes. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, ca I cannot stress the importance of, in hindsight, like, it yeah. doesn't matter if you're, if you're a parent somehow listening to this or you are a kid, like prioritize self-defense like whether that's jujitsu krav maga or karate or something um don't do it because you want to beat up a bully do it because the wealth of benefits the community the fitness the mental health the physical health aspects of it you know there's a lot of really good wholesome stuff to martial arts yeah but absolutely. A, but, but as a side note yeah if I'd have had that, I'd have definitely chinned my bullies old far earlier. Because <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. you get confidence with martial arts as well, don't Absolutely. you? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I started Taekwondo um, a few years ago and um, with just to sort of keep my son into doing it, really, because he wanted to sack it off. And um, yeah, the, the confidence it goes, you know, it, it breeds when you are confident that you can look after yourself. Is, um, yeah, is, you can is, walk yeah, taller. Is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. Um. So, something I did want to touch on was that story, the quite funny story of, you know, getting UK SWAT essentially on you. Because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a hell of yeah. a story. But yeah. But yeah. what? But something I really, it, it might this might be like a really deep answer. I you, hard to think of on the fly. But you did give a reason why you chose not to go down a particularly bad route. Because you said you in your own your own self, you went, I need to not screw up my life. I need to make something of my life. Yeah. But what what do you think was the main reason for that? Why did you why did you if it's a coin toss, why did young John go, I need to not screw up my life compared to young John going, screw it, you know, I don't care what anybody thinks? Because before that, you know, as you say, between the bullying your dad ruling with an iron fist it would have been easy to just flip you know the middle finger to the world and go screw you um i'm gonna do my own thing what 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 was that intrinsic um, intrinsic motivation for you to improve your life over just throwing it to the wind i'd always I, you know i'm i'm pretty i've always been pretty conscientious like you know even mm. as a kid i'm um and, and now you know i'm I'm conscientious and I'm um and I think I, even back then I was I integrity was quite a big part of sort of what I what I was about and I don't know whether you know if it's just looking around and seeing 
my cousins, my my sort of the cousin that I was knocking around with, his older brothers, who were, you know, they were working on building sites and, and tradesmen. And, you know, and their life would revolve around nine to five on a building site or on a trade and then going to the pub, mm. um, you know, or sit around on Saturday evening and playing PlayStation and stuff. And it was just like the people that were above me, and I sort of, older than me i was just like i don't want that that's don't that i don't want that for me yeah you had big ambitions uh, yeah and, uh, well whether they were just yeah i just didn't want to i don't want to i didn't want to and to be honest with you i was getting sick to death of living with my mum she's a, sort of you know it was so it was sort of like the perfect getaway of, i know that i won't be able to do these because they're set rules and i'll be able to move out and yeah it was just yeah, I just knew that yeah. it wasn't going to be a good place to be 10 years Yeah, down the, the reason I asked that is because there's no doubt a lot of kids or even young adults who are not are probably in a bad place right now for whatever re- of their own doing or outside of their control. And the overwhelming um, temptation to just go screw it. You know, uh, I can. They know that it'll be. It's the wrong choice, but it's the easy choice to make. Whereas you chose the hard choice and went and took the whole picture in and went. You know, actually, I'm gonna. I'm gonna do something that's gonna be worthwhile. It's just. It's just interesting because there's a lot. Of, you know, especially that age, you've got teenage angst, and you've just got every reason to you know throw in the tile and and say yeah. oh, screw it. It's just. I was just to get your perspective on that on why you made you know, the good choice, you know, to, to grab more out of life, essentially, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, just, cause not, nothing comes easy with easy decisions, though, does it? Nothing com- Nothing good comes from easy decisions, yeah. I suppose. Or nothing worthwhile in the long run. Nothing, you know, yeah, I, nothing yeah, worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it, you know, the harder, I've always found the harder decisions that I've had to make, but the reward will come much later, is obviously a lot better than that you know immediate yeah. that immediate satisfaction and then it's like oh crap it's it's gone it was felt good yeah. at the time but long term it's probably not going to be good yeah exactly yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um the other thing i want to have a chat about is you said that going to the falklands was coming of age for you now there's a lot of you know various meanings around that and people there's the whole film genre is dedicated to coming of age and yeah yeah that kind of thing but what why specifically was that coming of age for you why what what event or what experiences helped you become the man you are today well i you know like i I got my first military unit was uh very small rf brampton it was tiny you know it was tiny it was more like flipping butlins at the time um, um, and I, I was 18, 19, I was playing rugby for the station and, you know, going to work, doing my four on, four off. And it, life was a bit like a holiday that I was just getting paid for. Yeah. Um, and there was very little crime on RAF Brampton. So there was not a, not a massive amount going on in regards to sort of police work. Um, and the, the Falklands was sort of like the first time that, um, I'd, ever experienced the wider military from yeah. the sort of I don't want I don't mean to use the term the sharp end because it's the Falklands um you know and it's fairly sort of I mean I didn't even take a rifle with me they give me one when I got to theater yeah. it's it's not a dangerous place to be but there's lots of airplanes yeah <laughs> and um there's navy ships going out looking for some reason there's army doing army paras doing parachute jumps and it was like oh right yeah this is this is what i'm in um and then it was dealing with proper crime you know lots of assaults and thefts and um various other sort of incidents like car crashes and all that sort of jazz and um yeah it was like oh actually i'm now i'm a 22 year old man and i've got responsibility i know i've also got authority over people that you know are higher up in the rank chain and you know as a 22 year old bloke arresting sort of mid-ranking officers for you know not doing what they're supposed to be doing it's yeah it sort of makes you stand tall and makes you sort of become more confident because 
they will try and people will try and talk talk you down. You know, I mean, the the phrase that I used to, I used the most, I think, Anna Falkland was, "Please don't sort of misunderstand your rank with my authority." It's <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you might outrank me here, but I'm I've I've got this little badge here that says I'm a copper and yeah, stand by. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was like oh. I'm actually a big part of something as opposed to just yeah pain. do you feel like that is really the essence of of coming of age of recognizing finally the big picture and where you fit in it and also potentially start stepping outside of your comfort zone to see like how you truly stand on your own two feet yeah it was the point it was the point for me where I was in my own head I'd stop I'd stopped in my head I'd stopped being a child you know, even at sort mm. of 18, 19, with a, a signing out a pistol every day and, and being at RA Frampton, I was uh, in my head, I was still a kid. You know, I was, I was one of the youngest people on the sort of on, on the police flight. And everyone would look after you and teach you things and you'd go out and get drunk. And it, life was a big party, a big game. Yeah. It was the Falklands. I was like, oh, actually, this is this. This I'm, is real. Yeah, this is real. I'm part of something bigger than myself um and then more so again in iraq um a couple of years later at the end of 2003 that was um like i remember being we were being attacked at basra palace and there was mortars going off and rounds flying all over the place and, and i remember sat i uh, stood in a well, sat kneeling in a stand two position with a, a mate i remember turning around to him and i was like mate how the fuck has this happened like, yeah. What, what what are we doing here? And that was another like shit. People people are gonna die if we don't do our jobs properly now. So let's. So yeah. Yeah, that's stuff. So, if I may sort of dive into the whole Iraq and various tours thing. Um. For. I feel like this is a question that's not answered a lot, but for young men and women who are potentially considering a career in the military we have to face you know the stark reality that you could go to war people could shoot at you people could lob missiles at you you know break break the illusion and and i don't mean this in a bad way but like what is the reality good and bad of actually being at war like what you know it's easy to for the military to put on an ads at various ads and say you know um this uh, you know uh, like action scenes and stuff but like the you know actually you need to realize that this is quite serious um, and yeah. so what what is it actually like being at war uh, and like what 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 maybe perhaps were you caught unawares of that other people if they join the military need to be aware of what's it like being um intense amounts of fear and adrenaline followed by lots and lots of time being completely bored <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's like um it like a roller coaster of literally the highest emotional highs and the most focus i've ever given a task ever to sometimes weeks of boredom nothing yeah. going on you know um so in when I first got there, when I first went, it was exciting. Um, I was doing something that I'd been trained to do. Um, it felt good. Um, it was adventurous. Uh, and I was, you know, loving it. I was, I was buzzing. By the fifth tour, I was in a living nightmare. So yeah. it is not call of duty. Like it's seeing people with missing limbs and holding people's sort of heads together and you know having bits of molten hot metal fly past your head is um is fucking scary. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Waking up every morning knowing that like today might be the day. Um, I mean one poor guy man, went to went to the bog, mortal blew up and shredded him in a flipping portaloo. So oh my God. If 
yeah man so like if that's not uh, a sort of a wake-up call to to bring you back into some sort of reality then um i i, I don't know I, I don't know what is yeah. um but but would i do it again probably like if i yeah maybe i don't know i don't i don't know whether i'd do it again i wouldn't yeah. want to you know, if, if if they suddenly invented or not invented but suddenly started calling people up was it conscription um i'd be throwing myself down the stairs put it up <laughs> Fair oh, enough. Oh, 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 yeah yeah this okay. This isn't to like discourage people from joining the military. Like, um, you know, I think that there's been there's a lot of benefits to being in the military, but I think it's also good to to know the worst sides of it there, as well. There, there were more good than bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, more good exactly. Than bad. It's just that the bad yeah. affected me in the worst possible way. But yeah. that, man, the military, what what an adventure! Like. You know, I, I played rugby for the RAF. I surfed for the RAF. I, I did things that I'd never be able to do. I saw places and made friendships that will last a lifetime. Yeah. Um, but I also know people that got blown up in a toilet. So, yeah. Yeah, but I feel like that's uh, that'll be a far more refreshing, realistic look. I mean, you know, I certainly, um, certainly for me, it's been the making of me and it's been, you know, it makes, it does give you that sort of purpose of, stuff yeah. of being bigger than your, you're contributing to something bigger than yourself yes. um and i don't know about you but you know national anthem sings and you do stand up that little bit taller don't you oh, do you like the national anthem i do <laughs> oh, i don't know because like i no, i think it's like um, just out of curiosity just out of curiosity what would you have in its place I uh, no idea, mate. No, no idea. idea. No to idea. be fair, there's, there's, you've got at least swing low, sweet chariot, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that, I suppose. But the, the sort of God save our gracious queen, like invoking some non-specific deity to sort of, yeah, make non-elected sponges live longer. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, welcome, yeah. welcome to the curious Austin politics <laughs> side show. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, um, very jealous I, of the the bread of heaven that the Welsh Welsh sing and the the yeah, Irish yeah. song that that gets you stood up. On yeah, it. sure do the sh- uh, um, yeah. Ireland's call definitely gets me yeah, standing yeah, up a little yeah, bit straighter yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, but another question I wanted to ask um, was, especially this is this more applies to blokes, um, but can be applied to a lot of people. <clears throat> if you like, feel like you're suffering from PTSD anxiety depression what's your advice to veterans in particular but also even school kids and the average joe or, or woman who um who recognize who recognizes within themselves that there is definitely something not quite right but they're too either ashamed or scared to get help um get help <laughs> <laughs> simple as that There's nothing <laughs> to be ashamed of um there's nothing to be to be scared of um you you need to seek help man because the only way it's going to get better um is is trying is getting some help you know what i mean if you're already suffering with ptsd or any sort of mental health thing and just sharing it with a friend um might be the difference between you you know learning to manage i never i'll never say get better or recover you know or recover you just learn to manage it and it might be the difference between you learning to manage it and you know carrying on or someone having to cut you down swinging from a tree one day do you know i mean and uh and that's if that sounds shocking it's because it's meant to sound shocking um the, yeah you just don't, there's nothing to be ashamed of, man. You know what I mean? I'm a six foot four, 15 stone bloke, and I openly talk about mental health and PTSD. And I've never had anyone come up to me and go, I think lesser of you now than I did before I heard you talk. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, man, the only way to deal with it is hit it head on um, and smash it back. Oh, there's like, I, I said in one of my speeches, you know, a, a while ago is that I don't I try not to think of myself as a sufferer of PTSD I try to think of myself as 
PTSD suffers from me. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds yeah, probably corny, but I was talking to a load of suits in London. But uh, it's like, you I know, like I mean, it. it's, yeah, I have to deal with PTSD, but PTSD's got to deal with the shit yeah. I, I fight back with. So I would just urge you, man, just like, if not for anybody else, if just for your a, a friend or a loved one, go and try and, well, go and get help. Don't try. Go and yeah. get it. You read my mind there, to be honest, because I was thinking, well, the first part I was thinking was like, we never make fun of people for when they break an arm and the leg. Certainly once you're safe and all your mates can laugh at you and go, you Wally. But, yeah. you know, there's no shame in saying I've got a toothache or I've got a broken arm. But suddenly we get to our mind. And because I feel like that's the most, we feel like that's the most vulnerable part. Like that's like, you know, the true, yeah. the true you, there's no smoke and mirrors. It's like, this is the authentic you. And if you're struggling, it can be, you know, there is this fear of being portrayed as weak, especially with blokes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in that, you know, I've never heard someone say, actually, I'm really struggling mentally and thought, you know what? I think less of you, mate. I've never yeah, been in, I've never, I've always went, wow, fair play. That takes a lot of minerals to, to admit that. And yeah, it's it's also it's just, it's just it is a better culture now. I must admit that. Yeah, you know, yeah. we we definitely are more accommodating of of mental illness, and so we should be. Um, but it is just encouraging people to just treat it like a toothache, treat it like a broken bone. Yeah, like, yeah. There's absolutely. Nothing, yeah. It's not. It's you're not an ideal operating, but yeah. um, you know. It, it's it's uh, we can, it, with the correct help you can get sorted yeah um but then you also said you know for the sake of family and i 100 percent agree if you think i'm not worthy of help when you you know you love your wife's husband's son's daughters or whatever pick pick, pick whoever you love you know we will often go the extra mile for people we love we'll give up if it's just us we'll give yeah. up but if, we'll always go the extra mile for those we love don't we so yeah, yeah absolutely you know it's think something. about think about the improvements and the quality of life for those around you and obviously yeah. yourself if you do if you do get sorted but yeah that's that was just one thing i wanted to chat about as well um but something um else i wanted to ask was um do you feel that with the PTSD, do you feel like that it was exclusively your time in the military or do you feel like a part of your childhood contributed to it as well? Or was it just, just explicitly the military? Yeah, it was just the military, man. The military. You know, yeah. It's, um, yeah. I mean, like I said, we, you know, you used to get a good idea in every sort of you know, like <laughs> now and then it's like, um, but yeah, no, not like, my childhood was fairly sort of happy, right? You know, it was yeah. good. I was, you know, I was looked after. I had clothes, yeah. food, um, it's... bullying was, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was all. It's all around. Yeah, that's fair. It's just, it's stuff. just interesting that I, I was, you know, because some people do carry scars long from their their childhood and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, again, that's you know something. If even if you think, oh, I've, I've dealt with something for so long, it's like no, nah, just get it sorted it's i think people cover I, I was actually had a, a therapist on my podcast a while back and so he said something to me which was utterly mind-blowing in fact he said um two things so he said that familiar hells are preferable to strange heavens and yeah. i was kind of like whoa that yeah. you know because it's, it's so, like essentially better the devil you know isn't it yeah that, exactly sort of yeah, thing, yeah i mean like what what opportunities are you missing out on because you're too scared to take that that leap you know Absolutely. yeah but the other thing you said to me was that people become addicted to their depression and i was like that's insane because like it's because yes it's not a pleasant experience but it's what you know this mm -hmm. is how i've always operated and i was like well there's more to you than this you know yes. what, what's your perspective on that um yeah yeah i am um, certainly from the sort of veteran community um people leaving the forces um obviously leaving a big family leaving some you know so, a, a sense of identity and belonging and a, and a label on a tag um it's okay for amputee because they are they're physically you know oh he's an amputee so he's got a tag so he fits in with that there's a lot of um i know a few veterans that really struggle 
to break out of the whole PTSD thing because they let they see it as a label and they see it as an identity now. And um, so I can understand what you're saying about the um, getting addicted to depression. Um, and it's easy to hide behind as well. Man. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I can't do that because I've got PTSD or oh, I can't do that because, of, uh, you know, I've mm. got, I, I, I can't be in a room full of X amount of people or I can't go to nightclubs. I mean, I, I use it as an excuse still now. Like, do you want to go out nightclubbing? I would rather eat my own feet than go out <laughs> to a nightclub. But that's purely because of the crowd, the noise and the, the, the PTSD stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm probably guilty of hiding behind some that some form, but yeah, some people do it a hell of a lot worse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I can understand what he's saying completely. Yeah. You um you touched on something I was um thinking at the back of my mind with labels. Um, do you feel like kids, adults, everyone in general gives themselves a label and then they use that? Well, you say you use it as well. Use it as a convenient excuse to to not grow to not yeah. you know to, to yeah. stay in the comfort zone yeah absolutely i mean yeah there's you know um like I, sorry sorry to interrupt but for example like i'm the bullied kid or i'm the vet with ptsd or i'm the butt of the joke at work co-worker kind of thing you know uh, how, yeah, in, yeah. Your, in your opinion how do you break out from those labels um uh time alone was good oh, for me right okay um when the thing that helped me was i was all of the charity and you know but personally helped me was time on my own because there's nowhere to hide from your own head uh mm. there's nowhere to hide from your own head and if you can't come to terms with what's in your own head and address it yourself there's there's no you know you you can't lie to yourself because you know you know you can't you can't lie to yourself um so time alone was was enabled me to sort of be honest with myself and and then slowly but surely sort of be honest with other people um yeah. and and the, the charity were a massive help in sort of coaxing me through that and saying that it was okay to feel the way i felt and you know sort of um valid validating my thoughts and emotions and stuff and saying no, that's fine but, you know like register it accept it acceptance and personal acceptance is a massive thing that that helps me you know accept the fact that i am not the accepting the injury or the mental health let's call it an injury um for sake of description um accepting the injury and accepting that i am now not the person i was before it happened was a big part of healing um it's very liberating by the side yeah yeah because it, it's there's no like all oh, right i i'm not you know i'm i i'm not comfortable around massive crowds um i do have nightmares still um i um do get stressed and have random sort of body twitches occasionally and i do wake up in the night regularly in soaking wet with sweat yeah um uh but i'm not being hard on myself i know why it happens yeah um i've accepted it and and that way you can sort of address it or try to manage it more so yeah the more you sort of are honest with yourself the more time you you spend le less time trying to hide from something and more time confronting it full on gives you more confidence and then yes. the more you do it that confidence grows and grows and grows until you're basically a gob on a stick telling other people how to deal with their mental health problems. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, there's a couple of things I want to add to that in the, like for me personally, I like that. I like, it's, it's not pleasant sometimes, but I do like sitting alone with my own thoughts, uh, especially if I'm stressed or worried. Cause I like, I really do like to hash it out and say like, why, why am I feeling this way? and then take the appropriate action but something i do which freaks a lot of people out is i exercise without music and especially oh. running yeah yeah and i know a lot of people are like are you you like are insane what are you doing like why would you do that why would you put yourself through that but like when i'm running like i am feeling fully you know the pain of the exercise and i don't enjoy it but especially you know when i've got things going in my head and I just build up that mental strength, like everything's saying stop running, 
because yeah. it's just easier to walk and be at standstill. But actually waging war, so to speak, with that voice in my head and saying no because I'm stronger than you, and yeah. you know you can, you know, rather than drown out the the you know the thoughts in your head with music, I prefer to, to proper hash it out with them. Um, yeah, yeah, but a really good example. So I actually had to do. Have you done? Have you heard of Trim? In the rap, it, uh, like, it was like trauma risk management or something like that. Yeah, I um, yeah, I've no, I never did it, but yeah, I've heard the but term. I, they basically have people who can do very basic trauma assessments and then decide it's essentially if you need to uh, go and see a proper psychiatrist. Um, but I got to do this course, and this Royal Marine gave a really cool example, something that they don't show in the movies because it's not cool, but um. In the battle in three hundred, you know, obviously the the battle between the three hundred Spartans and the oh yeah yeah and, yeah, and, yeah, the, yeah and the battle of the Persians, um, obviously in that film it just shows them they're absolute nutters. They love going to war. They love yep. you know you know the whole battle thing, but realistically, what they actually did was um, they would cycle the guys about because even King Leonidas back then, so what are we talking, like 1500 BC, some archaeologists is probably pulling their head out going, no, yeah. completely wrong date. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, even he recognized shell shock and battle weariness and stuff. So if, 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 if even the 300 Spartans who were held in this godlike esteem of being the hardest men to ever lived, yeah. if even they suffered from war weariness and battle fatigue and not all 300 were fighting at the same time. They cycled them to give yeah, each person yeah. a mental rest. I'm kind of like, if it's good enough for the Spartans, it's good enough for you. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we've um, we've had a really good chat, and I'm going to start wrapping up now. But I do actually have uh, two final questions for you. Uh, so essentially the – you've got a lot of life experience, which I think a lot of people, especially people leaving school and university can benefit from, uh, certainly the veteran community for a start. Um, but looking back on the sum of your experiences in your life so far, what would be your advice to say your 18 year old self or your son when he comes of age or even people leaving school? Um, people were uh, my, my five-year-old son is that what you said yeah yeah for your yeah, yeah. What, what well when you're what advice would you give to your son when he comes of age when he comes yeah. of age yeah um um the i would say um we have this conversation actually eat eat, eat the frog have you heard that, that yes that's very good i like that yeah so <laughs> basically uh, i would say to my son I, st- I do say to him now, it's like, eat the frog. So if your job when you get up is to, at that point in your day, you know you've got to eat a frog, then do it first thing. Yeah. Um, if get you need to eat, work out of the way first. Yeah, if you need to eat two frogs, then eat the biggest one first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, just just get on. You need to do these things. These things don't go away. And, then, and, and invariably, the task is never as big as you blow it up in your head. Mm-hmm. So start and just, just do, just get on with it. Um, that would be my sort of advice to my son. Um, 18 year old self. Well, yeah. Um, so yeah, but I don't know. Um, get fit. <laughs> <laughs> look after uh, your health, people. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Look Eat after, healthy, yeah. drink water. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Um, I also know my 18 year old self would have just ignored it. Though. Oh, 100%. So, same, yeah. same here. My 18 year old self um, would go away. <laughs> and uh, and more importantly, to for this sort of podcast, people leaving school is um, distance yourself from dicks. hundred oh, percent. Um, yeah, I totally uh, agree with that. Hang around and surround yourself with people that are better than you at your given passion. So, if you, for argument's sake, you know, if you're uh, play the guitar, um, if you find yourself in a room where you're the best guitar player, you're in the wrong room um mm. you know you know what i mean um you seek out people that are positive uh positive impacts and positive role models um and cut the chaff cut 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 the cut the knobs cut the drifters 
you know, cut people out of your life, delete phone numbers, get rid of people on Facebook um, and surround yourself with positivity. Um, that would be my like, sincere sort of advice yeah. without without joking to an 18 year old kid or yeah. a kid leaving school. And I can I can totally relate to that. See, recently I've been very, very um, strict with what I allow myself to see. So, for example, on on my social media, all positive stuff. Every time I open social media, which I'm trying to do less of anyway, yeah, yeah. it's only positive things I'm seeing. Um, toxic people in my life, either no contact or I have to absolutely minimal contact. Um, yeah. Then, uh, yeah, positivity, being surrounded by people who you know will uplift me and believe in me um there's a really good quote uh, and we discussed about mentors and coaches in the previous episode so you can go check that out um that you know you are the average of the five people you spend the most time around and that you know that'll your wealth your career your passions yeah. you know um as john said if you're the best guitar player in the room the smartest person in the room you're in the wrong place um you know, and grow. Unfortunately, you'll leave some friends behind, but in the process, you'll grow into the person, the man or woman you need to be. Um, that's fantastic, John. So just one last question. And I'm toying with a few questions to potentially ask all guests, but you'll be the first person I've asked this to. So that's a <laughs> interesting one. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Go on, um, so what would you do in life that would make your five-year-old and 70-year-old self proud? Oh, what would make my five-year-old self proud? Um, and your 70-year-old self proud. And my 70-year-old self. Yeah, both ends of the spectrum of grinning ear to ear. Well done. Yeah, yeah, man, that is a difficult question. Um, I should have prepped you for it. <laughs> <laughs> I should have thought he going to send me an email a few days ago. Um, um, what would make my five-year-old and my 70-year-old self proud? Uh... Yeah, mate. It's <laughs> so, you know, um, maybe just live life to the full. Yeah, you just know. like integrity. You, know. you know, yeah. it just it. Look, yeah, as a seventy-year-old, I think looking back and just you know looking back at my life as a, if I you know if I'm fortunate enough to make seventy and go, you know, yeah, I I did more good than harm. I um I I brought some people with me. Um, I helped more people than I hurt. Um, and and yeah, and, and then uh, what would make my five year old self probably along along the same sort of lines, really? You know, my, yeah. if I could travel back and my or my five year old self could see me now, then yeah, I think it'd be fairly sort of proud. It'd be my five year old self would be absolutely disgusted <laughs> at some of the life choices his <laughs> thirty year old thirty eight year old self has, has made, um, and the people like you don't get me wrong you don't get to 38 with without upsetting people and, and mm. i am i am the dick in plenty of people's <laughs> stories i am no shadow of a doubt um but um but yeah yeah just you know my granddad sort of said it years ago before i i am not religious like mm. at all and like i'm not religious and we're talking about sort of existential life and god and blah 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 and uh he said look man if i give you one piece of advice it's if you take the word God, all right, put an extra O in there to spell the word good. Oh. And if you can look back at the end of your life and you've been good, chances are things will pan out all right in the end. And I, I've taken that to, to heart. Um, so, yeah, I think that, as long as... that is really powerful. I really like that. Yeah, well, I That's can't insane. take credit for it. It's from my, uh, my granddad. Yeah, but, um... I, I, thank you for sharing it, man. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> so, yeah, as long as they both thought I was a good person. Yeah. I I think they're both the upper left. Oh, hundred percent. Um, I like as well what you said that, you know, you're the dick in someone's story. And that oh, made yeah, me think sure. that and that would make me think actually we're all the we're all the the hero uh, in someone's story and the dick in someone's story as well. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, just a, yeah. a weird thing that came to me. Yeah, Man, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you yeah, so much for coming on, on again. Appreciate it. Well, one hundred percent, get you back on because there's no shortage of wisdom um, yeah, no worries. I'll and laughs as well. But yeah, yeah, once again, brother, thanks very much, and uh, we'll hopefully get you back on sometime soon. Yeah, no worries. Right, thanks very much. Take care, guys. All the best.